uh, uh, tyrants of uh, our Muslim governors of the past who killed so many Sahaba, right? And he can have a group of people who know his tyranny, but he's got such eloquent language and articulation, the way he speaks, that he's able to make them, make them feel sorry that they're thinking bad about him. You know, he was able to speak to people and make them feel bad about their perspective of him. That's how eloquent he was. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the middle of the Sikhran, that you know, some forms of speech are magical. You know, they just get to your core, you know, you knew how to speak in that sense. If he can do that, then a person who's pious like Hassan Basri, with the eloquence of the language, and Arabic is extremely eloquent if you understand it in, in, in Arabic, right? And so those of our brothers from the indo pak and other people who don't understand Arabic, you seriously need to learn, learn Arabic. Because then when you understand Arabic of the Quran, you really, that's when you get the beauty of it. You know, reading a few rakats of tahajjud with Quran that you understand, I'm telling you there's nothing greater than that. Allah give us a tawfiq to do that often. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to do that. So, you had Hassan Basri, then you had Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, according to Shaykh Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, he's got a very good book, uh, set of books called Saviors of Islamic Spirit. And I would really encourage everybody to read that book. The reason is that it makes you proud of who you are. Because you see, now what's happening is that a lot of depression is out there. Because we see that Muslims are being attacked all around. So those people who don't have a firm grounding in Islam, right, have not been brought up with a good education of Islam beyond what Salat is, you know. Like for example, I asked what's going on in the, in the, the what are the children taught at the madrasas, uh, after school programs, Quran classes. So I'm told that they taught Quran, and then after that they taught uh, how to pray Salat, and the basics of, uh, you know, Salat and Wudu and so on. Alhamdulillah, that's good. That's good, it's better than nothing, you know, because in America, in many places, they only have Sunday school like the Christians do, right? And I, I used to teach in one place that was about 40 minutes from my house every Saturday, and I gave up afterwards. I said, it's like trying to make them read a chapter of Harry Potter once a week, because by the time you go there the next week, they, they've forgotten the last part of the story, right? And I said, I just can't do that. You can't have your Islam being taught just once a week. So this is great, but we need to move beyond that. The children need to grow up understanding Islam more than... You know, because when a child only thinks that Islam is not about just Salat, then when it comes to philosophical issues, what they're confronted with at university, they're going to think Islam has no idea about it. Then they're going to subscribe to views of Kant and, uh, and uh, Nietzsche and uh, Derrida and uh, Foucault and you know, all the rest of them. Right? Because they just think that that's all that's available and because they haven't been exposed. That's why it's very important that we teach our children uh, an all-rounded understanding of Islam from every aspect. The mu'amalat aspect, the mu'asharat aspect, you know, the social aspects, the philosophical aspect, the, the theology, the jurisprudence and everything. That's very important. See, now you, you, you come with Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He is a grandson of sorts of Umar radiallahu anhu. But he's from this royal family, his father uh, Abdul Aziz, right? Ibn Marwan. Now, what you had is, he was not in line of the caliphate. It was the uncle's family, right? Um, what happened is that the Khalif preceding him didn't have children who were old enough to succeed him. He tried, that Khalif at his deathbed, even on his deathbed, even tried to dress him up to look older, but it wasn't working. So somebody on his side did a great thing and he said, why don't you give it to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, your cousin? Umar Abdul Aziz, his wife was from the, from the ruling uh, family. Umar, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was known to, you know, like good things. Being from the ruling class, you know, it wasn't ruling uh, party, but it was related, like good things and so on. He passed away at a very young age. But khair, they made him the Khalif. The Khalif of the Umayyads, I mean, they made him the Khalif of the Umayyads. You're talking about a major dynasty, you know, major caliphate. You know, the, the, they preceded the Abbasids. The Abbasids came afterwards, after the Umayyads. The Umayyads were first. And as soon as he became Khalif, it's like a light went on in his head. The tawfiq was there from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he did in two years and some months what none of the ones before him were able to do after Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. He had such justice after a time of major corruption. Because the Umayyads began to be known for confiscating properties and just indulging and uh, just literally the Baytul Mal, the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, 
the, the national treasury, right? The national treasury. Dipping their hands into that and just using it for themselves. You know, some of these Khalifs, you know what happened, right? Like later on in the Abbasids, you had one of them, they had a special procession on Eid day. You know when they performed Eid prayer? After Maghrib. Because it just took that long. And it was just, just absolutely crazy. It was just absolutely crazy. Right? So you, you've got all sorts of, all sorts of stories. So, so to have a good Khalif who's the, the, the wealth and the riches and the position has gone to his head, you know, that's something really great. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he had such justice that in North Africa, there was not a person who was eligible to receive zakat anymore. The distribution of the wealth without communism, right, without communism, got to such a stage that everybody was decently well off, to such a degree that nobody could accept zakat. Nobody could accept zakat. Now obviously, if you've got that kind of situation, that money can then be used for other purposes. You know, you can have prosperity in all other fields when that kind of a thing happens. But unfortunately, he was poisoned and it reverted back to them. They just couldn't take because he had given all of his, he'd made his wife give all of her jewelry back, right? Because he said that this was gotten through ill means, ill gotten means. And one day his children came to meet him, and he had his hand over his mouth throughout that meeting. And his children are wondering, why is that? And he said, I had, the only thing I had to eat was onions. Because he was so frugal, he wouldn't use the, the money from the government for his own letters. Uh, meaning, he wouldn't use the, the candles. He wouldn't use them. He was so particular about these things. He was just so particular. But that gave him the justice. And you carry on. And there's just so much more to say. You have the people, uh, you have the likes of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. You know, you have the Tatars. And you, know, you have the Tatars, I mean, they just came out with a force from Mongolia. They went through Bukhara, they raised it to the front. I mean, when you, you know when you talk about Bukhara, Samarkand in those days, you're talking about a glorious period. Because the Samanids, Samanids, they were the rulers of that area. The, the, the Khurasan, uh, basically a lot of northern Persia, uh, Herat, Afghanistan, part of Afghanistan, and all of Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all of those, Turkestan, all of that area. This is where some of the greatest of our scholars came from. I mean, let's just take a few names. We're talking about Imam Bukhari. He came from Bukhara, which is, you have the, the, the two famous, the number of famous Samarqandi scholars. Imam Tirmidhi, Allama Naysaburi, Nishapur, which is, which is also that area, it's in Iran today. That's where Imam Muslim came from. You've got Sijistan, which is Abu Dawud, Imam Abu Dawud, Sijistani, right? You've got, you've, got Nas, you've got the Nasafis, you've got the Shashis, you've got the, the Maturidis, you've got, I mean, you, you've got some of the greatest of the scholars that come from that area. Hakim and Naysaburi. You know, all of these major scholars are from there. And if, you, if you've heard of the great uh, philosopher, and he's normally ranked as the greatest Muslim philosopher, is Avicenna ibn Sina. He was from Bukhara. And he says that the Samanid's library in Bukhara was such that it had books in there which the rest of the world had just heard about. And it also had books in there that they had never heard about. This was the way they contributed to civilization. The Samanid Muslim Empire. Right of uh, that, that were based out of Bukhara, and Ajib about Avicenna. I mean, these were the kind of people of the past. He said he started studying when he was between 13 to 17. Unfortunately, he became a philosopher afterwards. Uh, you know, in uh, a complete philosopher who ranked the prophets the same as uh, Aristotle, um, or Aristotle the same as prophets. Um, the he he was such a genius. This guy that. He studied from between the ages of 12 and 17. And he said, by 17, I had learned anything that was going to be of use to me afterwards. By 17, he had accumulated everything that was going to be of use to him afterwards. After that, he didn't learn anything substantial. He just worked on what he knew and he developed that. Right? The problem with, the problem with these Muslim philosophers as such was that they believed, and I think it's important because many of us study philosophical aspects of the university, and I think we need to understand the reality of these things. Right? It was quite a shock to me when I learned this. The problem with some of these Muslim philosophers as such, right? like, uh, like Avicenna and uh, um, uh, um, uh, Al-Farabi. Al and then later on Ibn Rushd, it was a bit different. 
What they did basically was uh, Ibn Rushd, he was more Aristotelian, he tried to bring back refined Aristotelianism, uh, whereas the others, they were Neoplatonic uh, Neo uh, philosophy, which is a, uh, which is a composition of uh, Platonic and uh, Aristotle philosophy brought together by, by the people, and they developed that a lot. The problem with their thoughts was they had, uh, Ibn Rushd had this concept of double truth. Double truth. What that meant is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the common people who are not intellectuals, like the philosophers, He gives them the Qur'an. And He gives them truths through the Qur'an. Because they don't have the intellect to comprehend them. Whereas the philosophers like Aristotle, Allah just opens up their intellect, or God, or the unmoved mover, or whatever they want to call God, right? The non-contingent beginning, or whatever it is. He just opens up for them their mind. They don't need the Qur'an. So they are equivalent to prophets. Prophets are for lay people, and these philosophers are for the intellectual people. Right? Now, you had some like Ibn Rushd among them, who, though theologically and philosophically had this thought, right? but when it came to fiqh and salat and prayer, they would pray. So he, he penned uh, Bidayatul Mushtaid, he was a great faqih as well. Right? But you had others like Avicenna and others, who, uh, uh, and others who became Sharabi Kababi, as we call them. Right? Uh, Sharabi Kababi, have you heard that term? Just drinking and enjoying man. Right? Because it's all about thought, it's all about inte intellect. So when they call a Muslim, because they were from a Muslim background, they were from Muslim heritage, right? That's why they, and, and they, 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 they gave such a contribution to philosophy as general that like, people like Thomas Aquinas, Christian philosophers afterwards, would rank them as great, uh, great philosophers because they made such a contribution, right? I mean, they ranked Ghazali as one of the great ones, you know, with his, though he wasn't, I mean, he didn't, he, he didn't purposely contribute, he didn't want to contribute to philosophy as such, but because of his work and his, his, uh, his attacks on, on the uh, Avicenna and others, they considered him to be one of the great philosophers because of his tahafut and so on. But you've got people like al Ashari who rose up, because you had this major problem. Now, you know, the problems that we have to face don't just come from outside of Islam, they come from inside of Islam as well. Meaning, from people who call themselves Muslims, right? People who are Muslims. So, for example, you had the Mu'tazilites. They were probably the most influential group, sectarian group that we've had, because they managed to influence the, 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 the rulers, Ma'mun al-Rashid, the son of Harun al-Rashid, the Abbasids, and his brother Mu'tasim, and his brother Wafiq Billah, the three. And they persecuted many of the ulama. That's when Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal stood up, and he was the final frontier, and he didn't give up. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intricate issue of Islamic theology, which I don't want to go into. But they were trying to force him to say that the Qur'an is created. And he insisted that the Qur'an is the Kalam of Allah and it's eternal. It doesn't have a beginning. Right? Just, just keep it there because I don't want to go into the uh, in-depth understanding of that. But they persecuted him, they, they put him in prison, they did everything. And he refused. He was lashed 70 times, 60 times until he fell down and fainted. And finally, when he didn't give up, that was a final blow to them, and since then the Mu'tazilites declined. Mutawakkil Billah, the next Khalif, the, the, the fourth brother, he came, on, uh, he came on, uh, on, on the throne as such. And he was back to the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says that Mutawakkil Billah, though he's not a Mu'tazili, he's a greater fitna to me than the others were. Because he's showering me with so many gifts, and he's showering me so much, you know, so, so much honor that I find it difficult to refuse him. You know, I'd rather be dealing with the persecution of the others. These were, these were the ulama of the past, completely selfless. When Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal passed away, 800,000 people came out to his janazah in Baghdad. And 60,000 women came out. Women don't normally go for janazah. But 60,000 women came out and 800,000 men came out. That was nearly a million people. That's nearly a million people. That's nearly the inhabitants of uh, 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 of Baghdad that came out for his funeral. Now that is acceptance. That is kubuliya. You know, so many people praying for you after you've passed away. Then you had you had the likes of Imam Al Ash'ari, who was a Mu'tazili, but then he 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 gets tawfiq from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He was one of the uh, the Mu'tazilites. They were uh, you can say proponents of. Uh, a greater freedom of uh, free will. They had perspectives like, if the human intellect thinks of something to be good, then Allah has to also think that thing to be good. And if the human 
intellect thinks of something to be ugly and wrong, then Allah has to also deem that thing to be wrong and ugly. It's like the human intellect is making the decision and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to abide uh, uh, by that. It's ajeeb, you know, they wonder how, how intellect are you, right? But then they also said that justice is necessary for Allah in a sense that if anybody commits a sin, Allah has to punish them for it. And if anybody does a good deed, He has to reward them for it. And He has to reward them according to the good deeds that they've done and according to the bad deeds they've done. He can't, he can't give a bonus on top. The Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we say that if you do a good deed, Allah will definitely reward you. He promised it, He doesn't go against His, his promises. But if you do a bad deed, then you are Taht al Mashi'ah. What that means is that you are under the will of Allah. He has the right out of his justice to punish you. But he can forgive because he has a merciful nature. But they say, no, he can't forgive. If the person hasn't sought forgiveness out of the justice that Allah has to abide by, he has to punish him. So it's like if two people have done the exact same amount of deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't for one deed that he liked that one person to have done, he can't give him a bit of extra, extra rewards. He has to be, he's bound by a system. You can't bind Allah by a system. So they had become very influential and had by force through Ma'mun Rashid made people subscribe to their opinions especially with regards to the creativeness of the Quran and one person among them who was a student of one of their greatest um, Al-Jubba'i one of his greatest students was Abu Hassan Al-Ash'ari the great Ash'ari and he was a lot more eloquent than his teacher. His teacher was a good writer, good scholar, but he wasn't very eloquent. So Abu, Abu Hassan al ashari was a good debater. He was, he, was, he was very good at carrying their message and he was going to be the next leader as such of the Mu'tazilites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him tawfiq. See, Allah tests the people for a while and Allah will save his religion. The problem are the people that fall off on the wayside, get caught up in the fitna, don't have the strength of the deen. That, that's what the problem is. Abu Hassan al Ashari turns around. He goes to the he goes to the Jami Masjid of Basra on a Friday, and he then declares and he says that whatever I have been professing until now, I shed it off. And he took off his garment and he said, just like I take this garment off, I shed off my beliefs that I held before, and now the beliefs that I hold are found in these books. And he had a few books in his hands that reflected the the way of the Sunnah Jama'ah. And then he started to rebut them and that caused their decline. Later on, about 200 years, Abu Hassan Ashari passed away in about 323. 200 years after that, philosophy itself through Avicenna, through the likes of Kindi wasn't as extreme, but Al-Farabi, the earlier Razi, and all of these, it, 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 it was pure philosophy, pure Neoplatonism, uh, right? Pure philosophy, right? The Mu'tazila, they were just trying to reconcile Aql and uh, the Revelation, but whenever uh, the Revelation would have a problem with it, they would take the Aql on top and they would uh, disregard many Ahadith. They, they denied the fact that we would see Allah in the hereafter, stuff like that. But the, later on, it was pure philosophy. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person who dies at the age of 55, but within that life, Allah has got so much acceptance for this man that he makes him the hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. And in his free time over the course of two years, while he is the, the senior lecturer at the Nidamiya College in Baghdad, he studies the fundamentals of philosophy in his free time. And he writes a book about it, which later philosophers from Christian philosophers like Aquinas really considered to be a great contribution. Right? He was just writing it for his own notes. And then he, he deals them an attack. Tahafatul philosophy, Incoherence of the philosophers. And some would argue that that is what caused their decline. Others would argue that that is not what caused their decline. It did definitely, it affected it, but it didn't necessarily cause their decline. It was responded to after about 70 to 100 years by Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd came after him. Imam Ghazali passed away in 505, which is in Gregorian terms 1111, 1111 um, uh, uh, CE, which is 505 Hijri, right? And then whenever there's an issue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings up somebody to deal with that issue. 
Then, in the Muslim lands, philosophy did not really continue. The life was shortened. Whether it was Ghazali or somebody else, I think what happened is, definitely he dealt a blow, but w w the good things of philosophy, like logic, right? Logic, some aspects of epistemology, some physic, uh, physics, mathematics, that was, that was assimilated. They used that for the good. The metaphysics, which is the problem, which is where they, uh, they, they, they believe that there's God, not, they don't call him God, they say unmoved mover, the, the first, uh, the un, un, uh, non continued beginning, they've got different names. And then from him, they say, came an akal, an intellect. The first intellect, and then the second intellect, the third intellect, until the active intellect, and it's the active intellect that does, uh, runs the affairs of the dunya. So it's like Allah doesn't directly run the affairs of the dunya, right? But it, he does it through these intellects, kind of this weird metaphysical system, right? It's all conjecture at the end of the day. So it's, it's just conjecture at the end of the day. And uh, so Imam Ghazali was able to respond to that. After that, there's just so many people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. Like Sheikh Zakaria al-Ansari, Sheikh Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. All, all of these great scholars, they did, all did their part. They all did their part. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to send these people. Because he says, there's a hadith that's related by Imam Abu Dawood. That at the turn of every century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a reviver, a mujaddid, who revives the faith for them. Now I want to clarify one thing. Imam Ghazali is considered to be the reviver of the 5th century. Imam Shafi'i of the 2nd century. And uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz as well of the 1st century. Right? Ajeeb thing about this, think about it. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz passed away when he was, I think, 50 or 54. Ghazali passed away at 55. Shafi passed away at 50. The amount of work that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from them in such a short amount of time, right, is just absolutely amazing. Now, what is a mujaddid? Uh, who, who's heard of mujid, the concept of tajdeed and mujaddid? Just put your hands up. Okay? See, what this is, is that there's a hadith which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send at the turn of every century a reviver who will revive the faith. Now, if you compare people like during the first century and the second century, you'll have people who are, did a lot more work, a lot more service, provide a lot more service than people who are considered the revivers of, the, of, of that century. The reason is that the ulama have kind of agreed to a certain degree that the reviver will be that one person, even though others may have done a greater, provided a greater amount of service, the reviver is the one who is alive at the turn of the century and then he passes away. And he's being pointed at, meaning people are looking up to him. So Ghazali passed away in 505. Imam Ghazali passed away in 505. Imam Shafi was born in 150. He passed away in two, uh, 200 and, I think it was 204. Around 204 that, 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 that time, right? So people who are just over the century and they have just contributed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to do that. Who was the mujaddidin of the last century? There's a massive difference of opinion. You know, some people say, this person, everybody is giving their own. And it doesn't have to be one person. In fact, the ulama mentioned that if there was one, uh, 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 you could provide a, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could use different people for different things. There could be a reviver of hadith studies, of the sunnah, of the hadith narration, in tafsir, in social work, in just elevating the people in their, in their spirituality. Right? There's different people that Allah can use. What they say is that it's very difficult for all of those aspects to come into one person. And some have actually argued that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was that one person because above everything else, he also was the Khalif of the time, which nobody else had. Ghazali didn't have, nobody else had. So though they were the greatest of the revivers of that century, the one person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined all aspects in, because Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was also a great scholar, right? All of those aspects, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is a great candidate for that. Rahimahullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to send people. The problem is that we have our own lives to worry about. You can't wait for Mahdi. There's people who are saying, you know, we just wait for Mahdi now. You know, we're not told to do that because if we were told to do that, we would have been told when he's coming. So people think and they get depressed that everything is just so bad now that the day of judgment is going to come and Mahdi will come. And until then, we can't do anything. And that is a fatalist kind of way of thinking. You, this is not what we've been told because then you give up. You stop doing your own things. 
then you justify your wrongs. I remember in one place, uh, we were going to show them some books and some tapes. That they, I'd been told it was an Islamic bookstore in California, in Los Angeles, right? Very close to Hollywood. By the way, Hollywood is a dump, just to let you know. Um, Beverly Hills is really where everything is. Hollywood, literally, you go there, I, first time I went to Hollywood, I said, what's, what's going on? Rundown place, right? I used to give, I used to give lectures in West, uh, in, uh, what is it? West Holly, North Hollywood, in the masjid there. It's not a big deal, I'm telling you, right? <laughs> Beverly Hills looks a bit more decent, Bel Air and all the rest of that looks a bit more decent, don't you? Right? But uh, Hollywood is just, it's just the name. Yeah, the studios are there. But um, we went to this, this shop, they're supposed to sell, um, somebody said they sell Islamic books. So we went in there, and it's actually one of those, I really hate these places, right? One of those really despicable Indian movie places. They sell Indian movies. All those, that Hindu stuff, uh, the, with all the singing and dancing. I don't know if any of you watch that stuff or have that stuff at home. No, seriously, that stuff is just so gross. <laughs> and, uh, um, so that's, it's just got it all over the wall, right? And then I think he had like this small section where we were selling Islamic books. Now, okay, that's bad enough, right? Corrupt the people through Hindu media, you know? That, that's, that's bad enough. On the desk, he was saying Diwali memor memorabilia. Diwali is the Hindu, you know, Hindu uh, religious celebration, you know, with all the hands and uh, uh, the elephants and all the rest of it. And I said, you know, I was just quite shocked. I didn't want to give him my books. Um, I was just quite shocked at the whole thing. When I saw that, I was just like, you know, I can understand all of this. All right, you need to make money. This is the only way you find out to make money. He, by the way, he owns the halal meat shop down the road, right? <laughs> so, because I, I went to the halal meat shop and they told me go there. And then I found out they're both owned by the same person. And I said, look, I can understand all of that, right? It's bad enough. But why do you have to sell shirk stuff? Polytheism. You can't do that. And now the guy looked at me as if I'm from a different planet. He said, if, you're gonna, if you want to su survive in this country, you're going to have to do this kind of stuff. I said, I don't know what dunya you live in. Alhamdulillah, I'm quite happy. I make my money and Alhamdulillah, Allah provides. I don't have to do this stuff. The justification that people have, especially when, you know, when, when they feel that they have to do these things, it's, it's just shaitan. And that's one thing that we must realize, that you can't go down that path. Because you destroy your faith for whatever you think you're making. And we mustn't do that because the nur of Allah will continue. Don't think that Islam is a dying boat. Some of the Muslims are, but Islam is, is continuing. And Islam will continue. And when there's nobody left to say Allah, that's when the day of judgment will occur. But until there's people saying Allah, this world is going to continue and Islam will thrive. So let's not wait for Mahdi. Our focus is that we must wake up for ourselves. Because at the end of the day, we can't tell Allah that oh, we were waiting for Mahdi. Because we might die before he comes. And we have to answer for ourselves. And that's why it's very important that we correct our beliefs. We correct our practices. We correct our outlook. We correct our dealings. Imam Ghazali, he speaks about Husnul Khatima and Su'ul Khatima. And this is very important. Because when you've been accepted by Allah, you will get the kalima La ilaha illallah. The Prophet said, whoever says La ilaha illallah on their deathbed, they will go to paradise. And that is extremely necessary, that is extremely a virtue. And you know, I was just, there's a number of uh, deaths that took place in our community and mashallah, each one of them was saying, you know, and so and so was there and he made him read the karima and I'm thinking, subhanallah, this is just so much of tawfiq from Allah. Because when I was in America, uh, a, a student that I used to teach, a 12, 12 year old boy, 13 year old boy, he was the only one in that entire house who knew somewhat what to do when his grandfather was dying. All the other guys, his parents, extended family, didn't know what to do. Finally, he wakes up and he thinks, you know what, I read about this in Ta'limul Haq. Have you heard the book called Ta'limul Haq? It's this basic book that I taught to children, you know, and we'd cover the chapter in there how to deal with the dying person, you know, do talqeen of La ilaha illallah to them. He goes, quickly reads out, he comes and he gives them the kalima and his, that he saved him. Now, if, that, if, they, if they hadn't had any education there, imagine what would have happened. That's why education is absolutely important. 
Educate, we need to really get focused on our education. It's really important because it's very critical. At the end of the day, it's very critical. So, Husnul Khatima, Su'ul Khatima. Husnul Khatima is a good sealing state, a good ending of your life because that's really what matters. Because the Prophet says that some people are doing wrong all their life and then there's just a, a span of uh, distance between them and death, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns it around and they become good and they enter paradise. And then he also says the, the opposite, which is that there are people who have done good all their life and then they turn at the last moment and they go to hellfire. But alhamdulillah, through study, through survey, through statistics, it shows that that second thing happens a lot less than the first one. Right? Which is alhamdulillah. You know, because it just uh, decreases our chances of that happening to us if we feel that inshallah, we're already on the path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and show us the light. So, husn al khatim is very important. What Imam Ghazali mentions is that, especially when it comes to ideology, you really need to understand what is the right ideology. Don't get deceived by the various modernity and post-modernity and the various places that that takes you to. You know, we can benefit from the good of it, but we need to know the, the, the foulness of it, the evil of it, and we need to abstain from that. Because what happens, according to Imam Ghazali, is that when a person is on their deathbed, just like Pharaoh, when you're on your deathbed, Whatever you've been thinking all along, when the veils were on, when you could only see things according to the way you've uh, learned to perceive things and see things, right? Those veils are lifted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the reality of the dunya. He, he eliminates the veils. The facade is gone. And you see things as reality. You see the truth as truth. Now when you look back to what you've been thinking, and if that is different from the reality that now you perceive, but it's too late to adopt, you die in a state of loss and hasra. And it's one of the greatest senses of loss that you can have. That's what you call an evil seeding state. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Because imagine you've been thinking strongly about something all your life, and then suddenly, on your deathbed, you realize it's all wrong. That's why on the Day of Judgment, it's mentioned that you will uh, no disbeliever Anybody will go to hell thinking that they've been wronged. Everybody will realize that what they had done was absolutely wrong. They'll argue, send us back, this, that, and the other. Right? You never, you see, you hear arguments from people that why is it that they've only disbelieved or sinned for 70 years, but they get eternity in hellfire. Right? You hear that from living people. But you never hear that mentioned in the Qur'an that that will be an argument that a kafir will put to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, oh Allah, I was there for only seven years, why don't you give me seven years here and end of story. Their argument will be, send us back, just even for a short moment. That will be their argument. According to the, our scriptures, it's clear that they will be confessing and they will have real reality hit, hit them. That's why, in order to end this, what I would advise myself and everybody else is that it is extremely important that this community in Norway you've got other places in Europe to look up, look up to the studies show that in England where the Muslims have been there for only 50 years or so similar to, to maybe about 5-10 years more than, uh, more than here they've got more Muslim seminaries where scholars are produced you know whatever shape or form but scholars are produced Right? They've got more Muslim seminaries in the UK than the Catholics have Catholic seminaries or the Anglicans have Anglican seminaries. That is an amazing achievement in 50 years. In fact, right now, Ireland was the place that supplied the priests throughout America and other places. They just can't do it anymore. They just don't have the supply. But you look at the madrasas, Right? Well, alhamdulillah, we had the tawfiq to study, and mashallah, you've got a number of ulama in this country as well who have studied from these places, because imagine if you didn't have anybody. You know, people complain, ulama are not active, not active. You do need a critical mass before the one or two will really, you know, shine. Not every doctor becomes an outstanding, you know, uh, mover and shaker. You know, you just need a critical mass. That's why it's very important. You've sent out people to other countries to study. South Africa, England, Pakistan, other places, Syria, Egypt, Saudi, Medina, Munawar, or whatever. Really need to focus on getting something at home. Because 
the, you know, right now, don't live in this dream that Norway is a great place, they're cool with us and everything. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue that. But it could change at any moment. You just need some idiot to do something wrong and everything will change. And Allah preserve you. Allah make there not be an idiot who does something stupid. You know what I'm talking about. Right? And then it's just bad for everybody. So, mustn't stay in this sleep and think it's all good and it's cool. Canadians used to think that. They still think that to a certain degree. Right? But with their latest president, their latest, the latest prime minister who's more, who used to be more pro-Bush, right, they started waking up a bit. So you, you need to realize, you know, you, you need to assist your, uh, you, you know, you need to assist the Norwegian people in general, right? Uh, those who are not Muslim. And you need to take the da'wah to them as well. Because the da'wah came, you know, in Arabia, it was the people there that converted, right? People didn't come from elsewhere, it wasn't immigrants that came in. The Prophet ﷺ converted the local people as well, right? You have to show them it in a beautiful way. But you don't do, when I, when I heard of uh, other countries in, in, uh, in, in Europe, that some places the Muslims are looked down upon because they do all of the corruption. They commit all of the cheating and the de deceptive, uh, deceptive things. I don't think that's the case in Norway, but that's what Muslims need to, 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 to stay away from because otherwise you give an argument to someone else, you give an excuse to someone else, to persecute you and to, to limit you in what you do. Your deen has to be strong. Our deen has to be strong. But at the same, uh, 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 the main thing that we need to focus on is that when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we got something to show. And we need to focus on the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use whatever we have for the benefit of our brothers and sisters around the world and for humanity in general. That is a very important dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of us. Because... One teacher of mine is very, mashallah, is very, he's been very influential. He gives one bayana, the women send their jewelry to the masjid to donate it to the masjid. You know, you hear that about that in history, but this is in England. He gives a bayan, and there, the, uh, the way it works is that all the lectures in the mosque, they, they are transmitted through, a, uh, through a, a wireless system, and the women, they just have to put uh, on this receiver at home, and they, they're able to listen. And literally, they, 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 they can log in to, uh, tune in to about five or six different masjids in the area, right? It's kind of a very interesting system. But after he gave a lecture, this was about 20 years ago, they sent in their jewelry to donate to the masjid. And I remember that he used to have a magazine, and I received a copy of that magazine, and at the back of it there was an advertisement that we're going to hold an auction to auction out this jewelry to raise the funds for the masjid. This was all donated by the women of the community. You know, it brings you back reminders of the time of the Sahaba, when the women would donate like that, right? So we're talking about women donating like that. Jewelry is very important to women, you know? It's just something that's so mahboob and so, it's just so fitrati for them. It's just, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, right? But they, if they can donate that, that means there's a level of iman there. And women, when women get high level of iman, they can sometimes outdo men, right? In much more easily, according to some scholars, it says that women, because of what they go through in terms of childbirth and looking after their children, the struggle, the mujahad that they have, they have to go through, they can reach Allah sometimes a lot more faster than a man with a tasbih and a turban on his head for 10 years. So women have that ability because they can have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So women, women must not feel left, left behind or use their talent in strange ways, novel ways, right? revolutionary ways of notoriety, you know, going against the whole system. You know, that, that, that's not, that's not, I mean, I know I'm speaking about women here because that's what's been the big fuss in the last five, ten years, but men do that as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us qubuliya to our qabiliya, acceptance to our abilities. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to serve his deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to, say, to, to serve his deen, to make ourselves worthy of paradise and give, grant us the kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed and don't let there be a sense of loss and complete failure on our, on our deathbeds. Grant us jannatul firdaus wa akhirul da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi